This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Let me introduce Jeannie and then she can actually um, tell you a little bit more about her organization, though I'm sure you don't need to know about it because mostly uh, you probably do. And um, any of us who care about science education are forever indebted to Jeannie and her group. Eugenie Scott is the executive director of the National Center for Science Education, a nonprofit organization that supports the teaching of evolution in the public schools. She is a former university professor. She is internationally known as an authority on the creation evolution controversy in the United States. And we've had the pleasure of working with NCSE on our Understanding Evolution website and continue to interact with them any chance we get. Eugenie Scott. This is the world's... <laughs> this is the world's slowest booting laptop. So everybody be patient for a moment. But this will give me an opportunity, while the world's slowest booting laptop is getting to where we need it to be, to just fill in a couple of blanks. Um, Kevin and I didn't coordinate our talks today. And I thought he might bring a, up a couple of issues that he didn't bring up. And so my talk will actually make more sense if I, uh, as I say, fill in a blank or two um, uh, that he didn't talk about which is not a criticism of him. If you notice how, how well I'm doing filling up the air here while the world's slowest booting laptop, laptop does its thing. Um, in the beginning, uh, a phrase that we tend to use a lot at the National Center for Science Education, there was the effort to, of course, ban the teaching of evolution, which uh, culminated in 1925 with the trial of John Scopes for the crime of teaching evolution in the state of Kentucky, uh, Tennessee. Oh, that is a very welcome sight. <laughs> you never really know when you connect your laptop to a, a new system whether it's actually going to work, and it's working. So this is a good thing. Um, the effort to ban evolution, of course, um, succeeded very well. Uh, people tend to look at the Scopes trial as a great victory for modernism is a great victory for science over fundamentalism and so forth. That's because they're reading H.L. Mencken, and they're not really looking at what happened in uh, schools around the United States. Because what happened is Scopes lost. And evolution basically disappeared from the high school curriculum and didn't come back into the high school curriculum until after Sputnik, and there's a long history of that as well, in the, arguably, in the mid to late 1960s, which actually was beyond my high school career, so I didn't get any evolution when I was going to high school. I had to wait until I got to college. The return of evolution to the high school textbook and therefore to the high school curriculum stimulated the growth of a new form of anti-evolutionism called creation science. Now, creation science was the idea that you could take a special creation point of view, that God created everything in essentially its present form and in the most common form of special creationism. This creation event took place about 10,000 years ago, relatively recently. But you could support that with scientific theory and data, and that was creation science. And the argument was being made in the 70s and 80s that if you're going to teach evolution in the public schools, you at least should teach creation science to balance it out. You get a lot of talk about balance and fairness in this controversy, and there's a reason for that. I'll address that again a little bit later on. But creation science was an effort to try to um, temper what, they, what supporters considered the uh, negative effects of teaching children evolution in the public schools. Now, 
Creation science um, was a quite popular movement in the, uh, especially the late 70s and early 80s. And in over 22 or 23 um, states around the country, legislation was actually introduced to require that if evolution were taught, you had to teach creation science along with it. These laws um, were, uh, fortunately, uh, the vast majority of them died in committee, not of their own accord, mind you. It's because scientists and teachers went down to the state houses and testified before the education committees and argued against the introduction of these uh, laws, which would certainly have very negatively impact. Uh, oh, ah, oh, my staff is cringing because I just almost use impact as a transitive verb. And I'm sorry, I will never do it again. I, I don't know what, you know, I, it must be the headache and the, you know, I'm sorry. Um, had a negative effect upon the teaching of science in the United States. Now, um, Indeed, as this New York Times headline suggests, there have been a number of attacks on evolution, and the more recent attacks since creation science have really been quite crafty. Um, as this uh, recent uh, headline in Texas shows, creationists have adopted new strategies, and that is actually what I'm going to be talking about today. In order to understand the present day strategies, though, we have to go, don't try to read that, okay? This is the problem with giving a talk with an audience like you, because you're all used to reading, you're all you know, intellectual people, and you see a prop like that and immediately are trying to read it. You will go blind. Don't even try, okay? This is just a prop. Just look at the headlines and, and listen to me instead. This is, this is a problem that I have with intellectual audiences. Usually I can get by with this much better. Um, to understand the crafty attacks and the new strategies, we have to have a little bit of history, and this is sort of where um, my filling the air while the world's slow, slowest laptop got to this point uh, commences again. Remember those equal time laws for teaching creation science and evolution? Two of them actually passed in Arkansas and Louisiana. And the Louisiana law actually got all the way to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court decided that such laws violated the Constitution and were not legal to teach, and so the laws requiring equal time for creation science was struck down. However, the current situation uh, that we have had its genesis, if you will, in that Supreme Court decision, which was called Edwards versus Aguilar. In the Edwards decision, Justice Brennan wrote that teachers are free to teach any and all theories about the origins of humankind. Any and all scientific theories is what I want you to think about, because that, of course, implies that there actually are alternative scientific theories. Of course, creation science was pre presented as exactly that. It, there was evolution, one scientific theory, and then there's creation science, which is an alternative scientific theory, according to proponents there. Justice Scalia descended from the Edwards decision and Justice Scalia wrote that the people of Louisiana should have the entitlement to have scientific evidence against evolution taught. So if we look at the consequences of the actual decision and the dissent for the evolution, as it were, of anti-evolutionism, there are two major points. From Brennan, they got the notion that there are indeed scientific alternatives to evolution that could legitimately be, be taught. And of course, the most popular one is intelligent design quote theory, which uh, Kevin described briefly in his presentation. But then from the Scalia dissent, they got the idea that there existed evidence against evolution and that it was perfectly legal to teach it. Now, creationists were very quick to seize upon particularly this evidence against evolution argument. And that's what, that's what I'm going to concentrate on my, uh, in my talk today. Kevin took care of intelligent design. I want to talk about the evidence against evolution approach, because that has had a very interesting evolution in and of itself. Creationists were very quick to seize upon the evidence against evolution approach. And literally the next month after the Edwards decision was handed down, which was in July of 87, in the August 1987 Institute for Creation Research publication, Acts and Facts, the following paragraph appeared. School boards and teachers should be strongly encouraged to at least stress the scientific evidences and arguments against evolution in their classes. 
not just arguments against some proposed mechanism, but, get, but against evolution per se, even if they don't want to recognize these as evidences and arguments for creation. You see what's going on here? Evidence against evolution is evidence for creation. This was a very natural uh, conclusion for creationists to come to because it reflects very clearly their basic view, which they've referred to as the two-model approach. In the two-model approach, you have only two possibilities. On the one side, you have evolution. On the other side, you have creation science or intelligent design, some form of special creation. Therefore, if you can just eliminate evolution, creationism wins by default. So you don't have to come up with the peer-reviewed articles about, uh, creation, about uh, intelligent design or irredu irreducible complexity or anything like that. You don't have to come up with the science to support the idea of special creation. You just have to eliminate evolution. And because there's only two possibilities, therefore, creationism wins. Now, of course, there's a, there's a logic here that, um, well, actually, the logic's not bad. Because if you only have two choices, if A, if not A, then B works. But the problem is the premises. And that is that over there on the special creation and, and intelligent design side of the ledger, you've got more than just those two alternatives, one of which was mentioned by uh, Kevin in his talk. That's theistic evolution. The idea that God creates through the process of evolution is not proved by uh, eliminating um, uh, evolution. It doesn't uh, any more than creation science is proved or intelligent design is proved or any other kind of religious view. So you have a, a really muddled kind of argument here. But it's one that the creationists hold very, very strongly. And I think if you understand this, as uh, one judge referred to it, a contrived dualism, you'll understand what's going on in the creationist movement today. Because the evidence against evolution approach is really an effort to try to sneak creationism in through the back door. Disproving evolution leaves creationism as the default position, so you don't actually have to argue that Noah's flood created Grand Canyon like they did in creation science. You just have to prevent students from accepting evolution, and then they naturally will accept that God created things specially, because they're probably correct. Students also tend to think in the same kind of dichotomous fashion as creationists do. So let's just look at this schematically. First of all, creation science gave rise to intelligent design. And intelligent design gave rise to, after the Edwards versus Aguilar Supreme Court decision, what we can refer to as the post-Edwards arguments. And they take two forms. One of them is to argue that uh, their, the approach should be to present the evidence against evolution. The other approach is to present alternative scientific theories. Now, of course, as we know, alternative scientific theories means intelligent design and creation science. So it's a nice little feedback loop there. It makes things very interesting. But I'd also like to present to you that partly because of that two-model approach, or the contrived dualism, if you will, the evidence against evolution has the same effect. The evidence against evolution approach to uh, teaching uh, science to um, um, anti-evolutionism, if you will, really does have the, the same net effect of promoting intelligent design and creation science. So let's talk a little bit more about the evidence against evolution approach. There are a lot of euphemisms for this. And as we at the National Center for Science Education uh, monitor the creationism and evolution controversy around the country, we see the same phrases cropping up over and over. One very common one is to argue that students should critically analyze the evidence, the evidence for evolution. Now, let me do a little translating here. Because critically analyzing is not critically analyzing. It's not what you think it is. Critically analyzing is criticizing. If you actually look at the lesson plans, if you actually look at the arguments that the proponents of these ideas present uh, for classroom use, they're not talking about a critical analysis of, of looking at um, uh, different components of the argument and what's the logical relationship, et cetera. They want you to criticize evolution. Another uh, phrase that we hear a lot is to present the evidence for and the evidence against evolution. This was particularly popular 
in a series of bills that came up in the mid-1990s in Ohio, uh, in, proposed in uh, New Mexico and several other states as well, none of which fortunately passed. Strengths and weaknesses of evolution is a phrase that we're hearing a lot right now because this is a component of the Texas um, uh, Science Education Standards, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail later. Presenting evolution as theory, not fact, is another uh, phrase that we run into a lot. In the um, Selman versus Cobb County, uh, Georgia, textbook disclaimer, um, textbook sticker case that some of you might recall from a few years ago, uh, this was the heart of that difficulty, of presenting evolution as theory, not fact. Now, of course, as all of you people who are well-versed in science in this audience know very well, of course evolution is a theory because theories are so much more important than facts. Because theories explain facts. Theories trump facts. Facts are a dime a dozen. Theories are those abstract inferential explanations that tell us how the world works. And they are, uh, they are devised after a great deal of work and testing of hypotheses and, and inferring relationships and doing all the really hard brain work that goes into science. That's not what these mean. When you hear evolution being referred to as theory, not fact, in some of these anti-evolution proposals, what they're talking about is present evolution as a theory in the sense of a guess or a hunch or something that you really don't have to pay very much attention to. It's just a theory. Um, I've often told students uh, at when I do workshops for teachers, I have stolen liberally from uh, Judy Scotchmore. Uh, she has a wonderful uh, little um, exercise that uh, she en encourages the teachers to do for the students to help teach them what the meaning of theory actually is in science, as opposed to the street definition that, they're, that the students probably come into uh, at the class uh, thinking about. And she, she presents uh, the ideas, and the details don't matter, but is um, cell theory just a theory? Is um, atomic theory just a theory? And, or, and of course, you get to evolution. Is it just a theory? Well, no, no more than any of these other theories. So it's um, when you hear evolution being uh, argued in some of these policies as, well, we should be teaching evolution as theory, not fact. Uh, it actually is a creationist approach. Finally, or second to the finally, um, teach the full range of views about origins. I'll come back to that because that comes right out of an amendment to No Child Left Behind, which has been giving us a lot of problems. And finally, from the Discovery Institute, the idea that one should teach the controversy, which is a very clever bit of wording, um, implying that, in fact, there is a controversy within science over whether evolution took place. Now, obviously, there would not be a need for the National Center for Science Education were there not a controversy in society about evolution. I mean, I would like us to go out of business next week if we could, uh, because if there was no need for us, that would be just fine for all of us. Um, however, that's not what teach the controversy means. They mean pretend to students that scientists are debating whether or not evolution took place, and that simply is a falsehood that students should not be, uh, should not be inflicted with. We have had lots of legislation in the last couple of years about um, anti-evolutionism in some fashion or another, either promoting the evidence against evolution uh, ideas or promoting the, um, the idea that some form of creationism or intelligent design should be presented. There's a lot of different kinds of laws. And in 2008, we had quite a few, and it's only February of 2009, but already we're on, uh, uh, on the way to having a bumper crop of these uh, laws, I'm afraid. Uh, I'll show you a little bit later on how you can uh, find out more about these laws. To understand uh, a major component of the current evidence against evolution approach, I want to take you back to 2001 and the No Child Left Behind Education Bill, with which many of you as teachers are quite familiar. Yes, indeed. No child left untested, as the teachers call it. <laughs> Senator Santorum, uh, then senator in Pennsylvania, uh, presented an amendment to the Senate's version of the bill. Now, the first paragraph of the Santorum Amendment said, it is the sense of the Senate that good science education should prepare students 
to distinguish the data or testable theories of science from philosophical or religious claims that are made in the name of science. Well, I think that's a fine idea. <laughs> I am all for that. May his drive increase. The second paragraph, unfortunately, read, where biological evolution is taught. The curriculum should help students to understand why the subject generates so much continuing controversy and should prepare the students to be informed participants in public discussions regarding the subject. Not as good an idea. <laughs> now, why is this not such a good idea? This is not such a good idea because evolution is singled out from all scientific ideas as the only example of a controversial issue. The Santorum Amendment, paragraph two, was not really a critical thinking um, uh, encouragement as it was marketed to the press. Uh, and um, scientists and teachers, um, almost 100 organizations of scientists and teachers, um, submitted a letter to the conference committee when the House and the Senate bill had to be brought together to argue that this amendment should be dropped, that it was bad science, it was not good policy, and not something that uh, we wanted to see in the, in the bill, certainly not. Well, through the good offices, frankly, of uh, scientists and teacher organizations and lobbying, um, the conference committee version um, uh, of the bill did not include the Santorum Amendment as part of the bill. But politics being what it was, there was a reference to wording related to the Santorum Amendment, tucked way, way deep down inside in the conference committee report. Now, that seems like a bunch of legalese, but it's actually important, because the conference committee report is not part of the bill. It is not law. It is used, uh, should the law ever be challenged in the future, uh, to represent the views of Congress. It's sort of explanatory material uh, to help the judge or the jury decide uh, what was the um, what were the views of con Congress in passing the bill and its components? But it is not part of the law. It does not, there's nothing in No Child Left Behind that mentions evolution, that mentions any specific topic, science or otherwise. So the idea that the Santorum Amendment, a material that um, uh, does appear in No Child Left Behind, somehow is significant for science education uh, is really uh, an overstatement to say, to say the least. When the conference committee report came out, all that remained of the two paragraphs of the uh, Santorum Amendment was what you see in red. Student, students should distinguish the data and testable theories of science from religious or philosophical claims that are made in the name of science, which is actually the good part. Um, and the, notice that the rest of it is a little different from Santorum's second paragraph where topics are taught that may generate controversy, parenthesis, such as biological evolution. Now, that may seem like a small victory, but it is a huge victory. Because instead of this statement referring, you know, putting big flashing neon lights around the topic of evolution, it's a controversial issues top, uh, a paragraph of policy, which is not so bad. The phrase, the full range of scientific views, however, is something that we have encountered at NCSC regularly since 2002. Um, and it happens to be the case that uh, Philip Johnson, a law professor here at the University of California, has taken credit for basically writing the Santorum Amendment. And when explained, uh, what, when asked, what are your goals, he said he had hoped to accomplish to make it very difficult for public schools authorities to justify firing or disciplining a teacher who informs students of the weaknesses of the Darwinian theory, rather than teaching it in the authoritarian, dogmatic manner that Darwinians have been able to enforce up until now. You know, it's sort of like those, those dogmatic, spherical earthers. <laughs> but nonetheless, we are the you know, Darwinian dogmatists. It uh, has an alliteration there, I guess, that is, is attractive to anti-evolutionists. So I, I, want, I, I find this quote very useful in, in understanding what's going on in the anti-evolution movement today because it picks up both of those uh, points. The weaknesses of evolution uh, is in there uh, as if uh, teaching students the weaknesses of evolution is going to improve their critical thinking. And secondarily, the idea of protecting teachers uh, against um, uh, 
their districts or their the state uh, or in a, in a legal uh, setting uh, from being disciplined or being forbidden to teach um, creationism, basically. The reason why that protective component came up uh, and is of such concern to the creationists is that during the 1990s and early 2000s, there were a number of cases, one here in California, uh, in Southern California, uh, Pelosa versus San Juan Capistrano, uh, another one up in um, uh, Illinois, uh, Webster uh, versus New Lenox, where teachers were told by their school districts, no, don't teach creationism. No, don't teach the evidence against evolution. And the teachers sued their districts for their freedom of speech, uh, academic freedom, et cetera, uh, to teach what they wanted to teach. In all, of, all three cases of, of this sort, uh, taking place in the 90s and early 2000s, in all three cases, the courts came back and said, nope, <laughs> you don't have academic freedom as a K-12 teacher. A K-12 teacher signs a contract with a district. That means the K-12 teacher agrees to teach the curriculum of that district. If you don't like that district's curriculum, find another district. I mean, you know, it's different at the university level, and people should not confuse this. So these, the, the idea of the Santorum Amendment, in um, Johnson's own words, was to try to protect teachers from suffering the slings and arrows of John Pelosa and Ray Webster and uh, Rodney LeVay. So if we go back to our little flowchart here, where we have the evidence against evolution approach, we can sort of see a branching in two ways. One branching goes into sort of protecting teachers, uh, their academic freedom, if you will. And the AFA there in this little chart refers to Academic Freedom Act, which is something I'll talk about in more detail. So one branch of this evidence against evolution strategy is to protect teachers so that they can teach um, these creationist ideas. Basically, a get out of jail free card for a creationist teacher is what we're talking about. The second branch is the idea of critical thinking, that if we bring in the weaknesses of evolution or the evidence against evolution and teach it along with uh, evolution, that this will inspire the students to really exercise their critical thinking skills. And we all want our students to be critical thinkers, right? Raise your hand if you want your children to be critical thinkers. Yes, indeedy. We all want that. OK, so clearly this is the way to do it, right? Teach them creationism, teach them evolution, and they can be critical thinkers that way. Um, some of us would think that that's perhaps not a very good idea. Now, a very, uh, the first examples, well, actually not the very first, but the first very consistent examples that we had of this Academic Freedom Act or protective approach were a series of bills that began in 2004 in Alabama. And these were actually called Academic Freedom Acts. And these bills, um, beginning with the 2004 bill, protects teachers if they present the alternative theories of origin. Well, what, by the way, are the alternative theories? It's intelligent design, it's creation science, et cetera. So this is the get out of jail free card for creationist teachers, of course. And also, these bills in um, Alabama protected students, um, gave student free speech rights. Now, this is the sort of thing that any teacher is going to say, oh. <laughs> Can you imagine the term papers that would come in from students? Um, when I was teaching college, I actually made the mistake of allowing, I only did this two years, I was a slow learner. Not a one trial learner, but certainly a two trial learner. I allowed my students to write papers on creation science. And uh, I got the worst papers I had ever received. They were nothing but authoritarian quotes. Famous scientist X says this, therefore it must be true, therefore evolution didn't play, take place. Famous Famous scientist Y says this, uh, therefore it must be true, because he's a famous scientist, therefore evolution didn't take place. They were just awful. And of course, the Academic Freedom Act in Alabama and its various uh, descendants would protect students from handing in bad research papers, would protect students from handing in wrong answers on an exam. It's the sort of thing that teachers just don't really want to see. And of course, what this would result in is teachers just skipping evolution, right? Because it's such a pain in the patoot to have to deal with this. The, I'm sorry, Mrs. Brown, we just had to spend too much time on photosynthesis this year. We're just not going to get to those chapters after all. And that's the easiest way to do it. 
which is not a good thing. Um, over the last few years, we've had a lot of these Academic Freedom Act types of legislation, these protective acts, uh, and they, uh, there's too many. Um, my, my colleague Anton Mates has done a wonderful phylogeny of these uh, bills and, and how one begat the other. And the, um, there's actually even some uh, interspecific uh, ex genetic exchange here as, as elements get passed around from one to the other. And, and there'll be a much more detailed discussion of this in the uh, reports of the NCSC if, for those of you who are interested. But as you can see, even in 2009, we're starting to get the, um, uh, more of these academic freedom laws. Let me just give you a very quick summary of the um, Academic Freedom Act uh, version of the Evidence Against Evolution. They never mention religion. They never mention creationism. They, in some, some cases, some of the policies even specifically state this should not be construed as, as calling for the introduction of creationist ideas. Oh, no, nobody here but a scientist. Um, and of course, the reasons for that is because creation science and then intelligent design have both gotten flattened in the courts because they are examples of religious advocacy, and the First Amendment says that the classroom has to be religiously neutral. So, you know, to avoid the Establishment Clause and the uh, continuation of their legal failures, they avoid religion assiduously. They stress academic freedom. They stress free speech. Interestingly enough, there's a free speech clause in the First Amendment in addition to the Establishment Clause. They tend to be protective bills, uh, teacher license. Uh, teachers may teach this. And there's another component of that as, as well, and that these are permissive bills. Unlike the Dover policy that said, that, that basically had to do with instructing teachers to present intelligent design. Although eventually, through the months, it got watered down and watered down until it was just reading a policy. But you know, it started out teach intelligent design. These policies don't say thou shalt. These say thou may. You, you can do this. Now, that is a very clever approach from a legal standpoint. Because if you have a policy that says teachers have to do this, you can challenge that policy on its face. You can make what lawyers call a facial challenge. And I'm not a lawyer either, and I don't play one on television either. But you know, we both hang around with lawyers a lot, and we talk about this stuff. So there you have it. Facial challenges are a whole lot easier than having to wait until some teacher takes up this suggestion, this permissive uh, approach, and actually crosses the line in a classroom. That's called an as-applied challenge. You've got to find that teacher, number one, which is not always easy. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know how many of you have children, but not too often do they come home and say, guess what we learned in school today, Mom? That just doesn't happen. So a lot of, most of the time, you don't know what goes on when the teacher closes the classroom door. You've got to find the teacher. You've got to find a plaintiff. You have to find someone who has standing within that class or is going to be in the class next year. You have to have someone who's willing to bring suit as well as having standing. It's just a lot more difficult to do an as-applied challenge than it is to do a facial challenge. And we believe that they deliberately chose these permissive uh, wording in the bills as opposed to directive bill, uh, wording in order to avoid these kinds of problems. And another thing that we're finding with these Academic Freedom Acts is that they are embedding evolution with a series of other controversial issues like stem cells or global warming um, as a way of avoiding an earlier legal challenge from one of the um, uh, first uh, anti-creationism cases, so to speak, the uh, Epperson case, that um, strongly warned against singling out evolution from all other scientific theories. Now, let me talk a little bit about Texas, because Texas has very much been in the news. And Texas represents sort of that other branch of the evidence against evolution approach. Texas represents the, um, the, the critical thinking approach. Like all states, our own included, Texas has science education standards. And in Texas, they are called the Texas Educational Knowledge and Skills, or the TEKS. Now, like all standards, the TEKS are composed of two components. One is the content. You have to teach um, uh, solutions in chemistry, or you have to teach optics in physics. Uh, you have to teach um, uh, sedimentation in earth science, I mean, the, the content. The other portion of the TEKS has to do with what they call process skills, or science as a way of knowing. 
uh, habits of mind, how to do an experiment, stuff like that. So it's in the process skills that we find the problem with the TEKS. Uh, process skill 3A for many, many years has read as follows. The student is expected to analyze, review, and critique scientific explanations, including hypotheses and theories, as to their strengths and weaknesses using scientific evidence and information. Well, okay, that sounds like a critical thinking standard. Doesn't sound, strengths and weaknesses is kind of funny wording because, you know, we kind of tend not to really think about strengths and weaknesses of theory so much as use and, you know, um, uh, explanatory power, or whatever. But anyway, it, it, on its face, it doesn't seem like a terribly objectionable standard. And in fact, the TEKS um, 3A does occur in for example, the um, chemistry standards, which is presented here, and if you try to read this, you will go blind, but don't worry about it, and also in the biology standards, and TEKS 3A is, you know, is identical in both, and there's a lot of uh, kind of reused uh, concepts and ideas in all of the TEKS. The TEKS for chemistry or for physics or earth science or biology or environmental science, they're all kind of more or less similar. They all have statements about uh, evaluate the impact of research on the STS stuff, science technology, um, describe connections between physics and chemistry, and then on the bottom one, describe the connections between biology and future careers. So there's a lot of commonality in this. Okay, so one would think that if you have a statement calling for the analysis and evaluation of um, uh, scientific theories, and it occurs in physics and chemistry and earth science and environmental science and everything across the board, that teachers would be able to choose an appropriate theory or hypothesis to, to develop a critical thinking um, activity around, wouldn't you? One would think, wouldn't one? But that's not how it works in Texas, because in Texas, the only scientific theory to which 3A was applied was, guess which one? In 2003, in Texas, Texas was adopting its high school biology textbooks. And in, on the school board was a, was a strong faction, but a minority faction of creationists who wanted to apply the strengths and weaknesses wording of 3A to evolution and wanted the textbook publishers who had submitted books for adoption to go back and rewrite the books and put in the weaknesses of evolution because the textbooks only had strengths. And when you ask, well, what are the weaknesses of evolution? Because as scientists, we don't really have a list. <laughs> you know, you're not going to go over to Kevin and say, Kevin, give me the list of weaknesses of evolution, right? Um, the weaknesses of evolution come right out of the creationist literature. It's things like Haeckel's embryos, or things like the peppered moth, or you know, the, the, the common uh, uh, standard uh, laundry list that we're used to looking at and which have been long since refuted. Um, in the um, 2003 textbook adoptions, fortunately, the uh, cooler heads prevailed on the school board, and the board voted to accept all of the textbooks with very tiny uh, tweaks and did not require the textbook publishers to put in the weaknesses of evolution. Now, what is going on now in Texas? Now, you might have heard some of this. It has made the national news, and it's been picked up by the wire services and so forth. The, for a year, beginning in January 2008, new writing committees were appointed for each of the subject areas in, uh, in uh, the TEKS. And the committees have been working for a year, and they submitted last fall various drafts of the rewritten TEKS. And, uh, all, all eight of the writing committees submitted the exact same wording for TEKS 3A. The old is on top, the new is on the bottom. The new 3A reads, analyze and evaluate scientific explanations using empirical evidence, logical reasoning, and experimental and observational testing. I see some nods around the room. You must be teachers. Um, and now that is a real critical thinking standard. That is... You know, that is a, a useful thing for teachers, and they can construct um, a, a, a workable classroom exercise around this. And this, occur, this wording, replacing the old strengths and weaknesses language, occurs in physics and chemistry and biology and earth science and all of the, all of the uh, subject areas. The um, first reading 
of the uh, teaks um, was last month in January. And by a, well, creationists now have a majority on the board. And in fact, the leader of the 2003 creationist faction has just been reappointed by the governor as the chair of the board. So um, things were very tense last month in uh, Austin uh, when I and my colleagues were there working with our uh, Texas Citizens for Science and Texas Freedom Network, our other allies in the state. And we watched with white knuckles as the creationist faction tried to remove the new 3A language and go back to the old 3A language. You know, the, the politics are incredible in Texas. I mean, we think, we think Sacramento is kind of a curious place. You ain't seen Austin. Um, the effort to go back to the old 3A wording failed on a tie vote, seven to seven. So because there was, you know, they, they had, in order to get the old wording in, they had to have eight to seven. And one of the guys was out on a walk. Um, <laughs> Nobody knew where he was. He was gone. Uh, but we did know that he was really upset because the chairman had appointed somebody else to a committee, and so he was sort of having a little mad, and he was, out. I mean, has nothing. If you think this has to do with science, it doesn't. That This has nothing to do with science. This has to do with internal politics and all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay, so um, 3A, uh, the new wording was saved. The old strengths and weaknesses wording uh, was not reinserted. And that was a huge, huge victory for uh, science education in Texas. That said, the uh, creationists were prepared with a very long list of amendments to make to the, to the TEKS to water down the uh, uh, presentation of evolution. It was interesting because there is a brand new earth and space science uh, TEKS, basically bringing geology back and planetary science back. And uh, there was a lot of evolution in there. I mean, the, the guy who wrote it is an NCSE member, good man. And there's a lot of evolution in the ESS TEKS. Um, they went through those with a, with a fine tooth comb. And any TEK having to do with radio, uh, radioisotopic dating, with uh, any sort of um, change through time, um, paleontology, those had to be tweaked, um, tweaking the TEKS to uh, water down the coverage of evolution, make it more tentative. Um, instead of saying, describe you know, the paleontological record for such a, no. Discuss whether the paleontological record, you know, it's stuff like that. Well, unfortunately, our allies on the board didn't really understand what was going on. And in most cases, these weakening amendments were passed. There will be another school board meeting in March. Tune in for future attractions, so to speak. Um, we will find, we will see whether it's possible to uh, get rid of those weakening amendments and actually have some science education standards in Texas that are worth something. The National Center for Science Education's website has a lot of information on this and other aspects of the creationism and evolution controversy. If you go to the news button up there on top, you will be taken to this page. And I call your attention to a couple of sorting possibilities. You can sort for a state, California or Texas or wherever. You can sort for this year, last year, whatever. It, it, it's very easy to get around in this, um, in this uh, uh, website, so I would encourage you to take a look. The address is ncseweb.org, and I will call your attention to one more item here. In the far upper right-hand corner, it says join. <laughs> Oftentimes when I talk and when I describe NCSC, people say, I didn't know it was a membership organization. Now you know. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your Darwin development. The question, the question was, what if the creationists won? Well, I would say, and I mean, clearly, people can live, live long and happy lives without ever knowing anything about Charles Darwin, without ever knowing anything about a common ancestry of living things, uh, without ever knowing anything about um, natural selection and other mechanisms of change. Uh, certainly, most of the planet uh, goes 
uh, most of the human beings on the planet do just fine without very much knowledge about evolution. That's also true of Mozart. Um, I, I'm going to make an argument that is not practical. I'm going to make an argument, and there are practical arguments, and uh, Kevin can make them, or I'll make them if he doesn't feel like it. But it certainly is the case that if you understand that evolution has occurred, if you understand that every living creature, plant or animal, single-celled, multi-celled on this planet, has had a, an incredible history linking back through um, relationships, ancestral relationships, just genealogical relationships through time, it gives you a very different perspective, I think, on who you are, what you are, where, what is your place in nature. And this is true whether you are a religious individual or whether you are a non-religious individual. There is, a, there is a huge change in awareness, I think, as people truly understand uh, what evolution means. And it is also an absolutely fascinating uh, set of scientific ideas and theories and explanations that it would be very sad if people were unable to learn. Uh, everybody knows an eight-year-old who's crazy about dinosaurs, right? Well, you think dinosaurs are cool. Wait till you hear everything else that's going on in evolution. There are also practical reasons for uh, understanding evolution. And of course, they are legion. Physicians really have to know a whole lot more about evolution than they do. Um, people using antibiotics have to know a whole lot more about evolution than they do. People who deal not just in medicine, but people who deal with horticulture and agriculture need to know a lot more about evolution than they do. Um, there are, uh, and, and this is not just microevolution, okay? This is not just the, the, the mechanics of evolution, not just the idea of natural selection and drift and the other um, processes that influence change. It's also the idea of, of common ancestry itself. Uh, my colleague, uh, Josh Rosenau and I were, were, during the lunch hour, talking about his talk that he's going to be giving at AAAS next week. And one of the examples that he's going to use is a really great one. You remember, you know, Taxol, the uh, anti-cancer drug, a wonderful drug. Do you remember how about six or seven years ago, there was this great worry that all the ewes, uh, the trees up there in the northwest corridor were going to be poached to death because that was the source of Taxol? Well, it happens to be you know, a tree that is not in vast quantity. But if you look at the phylogeny of yew trees, if you look at the relationship of those yew, that, that um, yew tree that is um, uh, getting scarcer and scarcer and is, is not very numerical, and you look at its relative, which is what phylogeny is, it's the looking at reconstructing that uh, genealogical relationship. Um, what are the, you know, who shared a common ancestor more recently with others? If you look at that whole phylogeny, uh, that whole taxonomy of yew trees, you can find that there are relatives of that scarce yew that you can use to make taxol. And that is a very practical thing, especially if you know anybody with cancer. The question was, did Bush prepare a signing statement, which you recall from the last eight years, were ways that the administration managed to avoid doing some of the things Congress wanted to do, uh, or adding things to bills uh, that uh, more closely um, uh, reflected the administration's perspective. Um, did he, was there a signing statement accompanying No Child Left Behind? If there was, it didn't refer to evolution. Um, the thing about, a, a question that we got asked at NCSE a lot in the last couple of weeks and the build up to the uh, change of administrations was how will the current, the new incoming administration change what you do day by day? And we had to say hardly at all um, because the creationism and evolution issue is a curriculum issue and there is virtually zero influence of the federal government on curricular issues. Um, the first thing I have to do when I talk to a foreign reporter from Europe or Great Britain or Japan or someplace like that is explain to them, we don't have a national curriculum. And they are just gobsmacked. They, you what? You don't have a national curriculum? How crazy. Um, I have to explain to them that the American tradition, and you know we've had a different history, there's reasons for it. The American tradition is decentralized education. So a phenomenal number of decisions are made at that local school board level. 
Um, more decisions are made at the state level, hardly any decisions, and virtually nothing having to do with curriculum take place at the national level. So, you know, for good or for ill, um, uh, we will continue to fight these local battles, a school district by school district, state by state, when it comes to the teaching of evolution. We don't have a top-down. If this were France, no problem. <laughs> Tomorrow, you're going to teach this, and that's it. The question was, what is it about evolution that makes it so hard for religious fundamentalists? Um, it's not just religious fundamentalists, okay? Uh, if you look at the um, statistics, that you look at the polls, uh, the surveys, as Kevin pointed out, about 25 to 30 percent of American Christians are conservative Christians, more or less biblical literalist in some fashion. It's understandable why evolution doesn't work for them. If you believe that God specially created everything in its present form, the idea of common ancestry is going to be a tough sell. But there's an awful lot of American Christians who belong to Catholic and mainstream Protestant faiths that also are nervous about evolution, because otherwise you wouldn't get that you know, 40 to 45 percent rejection of evolution in, in, the, in the United States. So part of it is biblical literalism. That's probably the core, the basic group. But there are a lot of people who are very nervous about evolution for a variety of reasons. One is that if, one is what theologians call human exceptionalism. If human beings are the result of the same processes that produce, you know, Darwin's barnacles, okay, uh, or warthogs, or, you know, icky things, um, viruses, uh, if, if we're the result of the same processes that all this other living things are the result of, are we really special to God? And a lot of, I'm, a lot, you know, there's theological, you know, ways of dealing with this, but this is a worry of many people. They believe that if God works through these secondary causes, if God works through natural selection, if God works through created law, then, then God has stepped back a couple feet. And he's not directly involved with me and with you know, answering my prayers and so forth. Now, as I say, there are plenty of Christian theologians that have dealt with these issues. But those are the most common uh, reasons given. Because human beings are being talked about rather than falling objects. I mean, you know, it, it's, much, it's much more sensitive to deal with living things than it is to deal with relatively inanimate processes like why do the planets go around the sun? Although that was a sticky issue at one point, remember? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but you know, the idea of God working through uh, created law, you know, it, that, that was Newton's big contribution, really, uh, to theology. I mean, he argued that God was actually grander by having invented the, the laws of, of motion and gravitation and so forth. Previous to Newton, um, the idea was perfectly defendable that, that God sent the angels to guide the planets around the sun uh, in their, or alternatively around the earth. Um, to, you know, but, but you know, the idea of, of, of you know, God himself or the angels out there pushing the planets around was a perfectly reasonable explanation. Well, Newton thought that God was much grander if, like the great watchmaker, you know, we're talking 1600s now, those metaphors were very popular. Um, if God could have created all of that and, and managed to make the planets go around the sun purely by natural law rather than having the angels out there giving stuff nudges, um, this was a much grander God, much more worthy of worship. That general idea hasn't quite sunk in about biology yet. It has sunk in with Catholics, it has sunk, sunk in with mainstream Protestants, but in the United States we have a much more conservative form of Christianity than you find in, uh, on the continent or Great Britain. And I've written about this in, in my book and, and others have written about it. It's, it's a fairly well-known history that the particular form of Protestantism called fundamentalism was basically a homegrown American institution. This was a fairly recent development in Christianity, taking place uh, in the early couple decades of the 20th century, um, 1913, 1918 approximately, the 12 fundamentals, the, the booklets that outlined fundamentalist uh, Christianity were written. So, you know, the idea of, of biblical literalism, which is sort of where fundamentalism went 
within a few decades. Uh, the idea of biblical literalism is, is much more popular in the United States than it is in, say, European Christianity. Kevin mentioned a book called Explore Evolution. And uh, earlier there was Of Pandas and People. And in fact, uh, if, you, if you nearly were to Google evidence against evolution, you'd get lots of creationist sites. Uh, I'm sorry, her question was what, what, are the, what is the evidence against evolution? Scientific. Scientific. Right. I know all the evidence. But... Well, yeah. <laughs> what are they giving teachers to use? Things like Explore Evolution. Uh, the book Explore Evolution has chapters critiquing the concept, for example, of homology. Uh, which Kevin defined as referring to a similarity of parts, and ultimately this is the result of common ancestry. Because you know, why else do we have the same? You know, why do all tetrapods have the same foreland pattern, and so forth? Um, critiquing the evidence, uh, or, or cre critiquing the idea of homology as being the result of common ancestry. Um, instead, it's a bow plan. You know, God made them on the same plan. But of course, they don't say that because the whole nature of the Explore Evolution book is to, you know, evolution didn't happen, therefore creationism wins by default. It's that two model approach. And actually, anything that's been scientifically tested, science as we know it, that goes through a peer review and testing process, that's been tested scientifically and proven anything in the contrary, what they're saying here, here it is, you can use that against evolution. Rest assured. There has not been any peer-reviewed uh, literature, no scientific experiments, no um, experiments or observations or anything that could be considered legitimate science that would challenge the idea that living things had common ancestors. Just check. <laughs> As well you might. <laughs>